Good afternoon. Thank you for coming and being available today to talk um, about the implementation record for SB 1383. I really appreciate you being here and your contribution to today's chat. We're going to be providing a very short overview of SB 1383 requirements for the implementation record and the related tools and resources. And this will be followed by four amazing presentations from the city of Laguna Niguel, Sacramento County, Culver City, and the city of Los Angeles. We are incredibly fortunate to have these jurisdictions here today to share their experiences and approaches for developing the SB 13, developing and maintaining the SB 1383 implementation record. We also have reserved time for questions and answers and peer matching to give you as attendees the chance to ask questions or to speak about challenges and or solutions that others might find helpful. Next slide. All right, we still have folks joining, but I think I'll keep us on track here. And uh, I don't have any specific updates from other program areas within the department, but I wanted to go over a little bit more of the implementation record um, before we get into the presentations. So SB 1383 created a new record keeping requirement for jurisdictions. And during the rulemaking process, there was considerable effort to include more or most information in the implementation record keeping requirements, opposed to having all the information or data reported in the ear. Uh, the implementation record is also the first thing that Cal Recycle asks for when JACE, the Jurisdiction and Agency Compliance and Enforcement um, branch, starts each compliance evaluation. And we've dropped the chat in, we've dropped into the chat Power Cycles webpage address or URL covering the SB 1383 record keeping requirements, as well as two of the tools that are housed on that page. One is the model implementation workbook. And the second is the implementation record checklist. And to, to assist jurisdictions with SB 1383 record keeping, CalRecycle posted an implementation um, record checklist, which I just mentioned, on a, our website last February. And, the, and this checklist is a Microsoft Word document that outlines in a check map, check mark format, excuse me, all records that are required to be maintained in the implementation record. The checklist is also designed to be used in conjunction with the model implementation record tool. And these documents have been designed, again, to work together to provide you as jurisdictions um, information and guidance in creating the implementation record as required by SB 1383. And as we move into the jurisdiction present presentations, you're going to see firsthand how these and other tools are being used in the development and maintenance of the SB 1383 implementation record. And Darren, I think that takes us into um, slide four. Thank you, Marshall. So I want to go over a couple of webinar logistics to begin with. Um, starting with the question and answer session process, please type a summary of your question into the Q&A pane. While you may use the chat pane to share information or resources with other participants, please do not put your questions into the chat. If you do not see the Q&A pane, please make sure you have the most updated version of Zoom. Once called upon, please unmute yourself and state your name, affiliation, and restate your question when asked by CalRecycle staff. If it is geared towards a specific panelist, please note that and we'll make sure that it gets to them. You may also request peer share requests, feedback, and panelists' questions 
to slcp.organics at calrecycle.ca.gov using the subject line SB 1383 chat with CalRecycle. If you cannot unmute yourself or un are unable to submit your question, please also submit those questions to the SLCP inbox and we will have our LAMP representative get back to you in a timely manner. Next slide. So I will now uh, review the order of our presenters. We will first off be starting with the city of Laguna Niguel um, with their consultant economics. Second, we'll have Culver City with Go to Zero Strategies. Third, Sacramento County. Fourth, City of Los Angeles. And we will end the webinar um, with questions and answers at the end. So Darren, we're now going to move on to our first panelist, and they're going to be introduced by our CalRecycle staff member, Annie. Good afternoon, everyone. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our first presenters, Kevin O'Connor and Kim Riley. Kevin O'Connor has a master's degree in public administration from the University of Southern California. Kevin works for the city of Laguna Niguel, serving as a management assistant in the city manager's office where for the last four years, he has overseen the city's solid waste and recycling franchise agreement and managed the implementation of SB 1383 regulations in the city. Kim Riley is the project director with Economics Inc., a sustainability consultancy specializing in solid waste and recycling. She has worked with the city of Laguna Niguel for four years and focuses on assisting the city with SB 1383 implementation and hauler contract management. During this time, in close coordination with the city's franchise hauler, CRNR, she has overseen the full implementation of the city's three container system at commercial and multifamily properties, the expansion of the city's edible food recovery effort, creating and maintaining the city's SB 1383 implementation record, launching a multimedia marketing effort for organics recycling, and ensuring compliance with the city's SB 1383 aligned to franchise agreement with the hauler. Ms. Riley also assists other cities in Orange County with SB 1383 compliance, as well as implementing circularity programs to tackle corporate clients. Kevin and Kim, take it away. Thank you, Annie. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure being on this call with all of you this afternoon. As Annie mentioned, my name is Kevin O'Connor, and I work for the City of Laguna Niguel. Joining me today is Kim Riley from Economics, the City's Solid Waste and Recycling Consultant. We have had the privilege today to discuss the City of Laguna Niguel's implementation record and share our process for managing our record keeping pool. Since we have attendees from all over the state, I want to start by providing a brief overview of the City of Laguna Niguel and identify some key factors that will help shape our discussion today before I hand over the presentation to Kim to review the City's record keeping pool. Darren, next slide, please. Thank you. The city of Laguna Niguel operates as a contract city located in South Orange County, roughly the midway point between Los Angeles and San Diego. With a population of 64,239 residents, Laguna Niguel is predominantly a bedroom community with 27,000 residential dwellings and 45 multifamily properties. In Laguna Niguel, we have an exclusive franchise agreement with CRNR Incorporated, which has provided the city with services for over 25 years. Next slide, please. There are several key factors that have allowed the cities to succeed in the implementation of SB 1383, including the development of the city's record keeping pool. In 2018, the city, in partnership with Economics, renegotiated the city's franchise agreement in anticipation of pending SB 1383 regulations. This proactive approach allowed the city to implement detailed reporting requirements that positioned the city well when SB 1383 took effect. On a monthly basis, the city, CRNR, and Economics meet to discuss current SB 1383 implementation efforts, ask questions on hauler submitted reports, and identify upcoming reporting requirements. As the city's representative, I coordinate with other city departments to ensure the necessary record keeping data is shared and uploaded into our re implementation record. A critical factor is this coordination between city departments and it's bringing them into the fold early so they can be part of the process of updating the record keeping pool. For a better understanding of the city's SB 1383 record keeping log, I will now turn it over to Kim Riley from Economics. Thanks, Kevin. Next slide. 
So as Kevin mentioned, I'll dig into the actual record itself, and I'll first talk through some of those partnership details that um, some more about those partnership details Kevin mentioned. And so the Kevin mentioned the SB 1383 Focus Franchise Agreement, which includes many SB 1383 elements for the hauler to complete on behalf of the city. And one big example of that are the route reviews that are conducted by CRNR, the city's hauler, um, which uh, is done for the residential, commercial, and multifamily. And this fulfills the city's container contamination minimization requirements. And so part of the franchise agreement requires that that reporting um, gets submitted to the city. And so um, that's that's one of those uh, details there. It includes generator details, photos, contamination types. So those reports get submitted to the city um, on, to fill out the SB 1383 record. Um, the second bullet point there uh, in this screenshot that you see of this letter is a letter agreement um, as a direct service provider agreement of RNG. So this is one of those items that's not included in the franchise agreement, but the city has come up with a unique um, way to memorialize this. Um, and so hauler collection vehicles in the city are powered by RNG from organic waste collected from within the city and processed at the hauler's anaerobic digester. And the city and the hauler memorialized this uh, recovered organic waste product in a direct service provider letter agreement just last year in 2023. And in there, I know the text is quite tiny, but um, it includes reporting of that amount of RNG to the city, as well as documenting documentation, so invoices or any records of that RNG. And then just this year, the city council approved a franchise amendment that includes those terms in the reporting of this direct service provider agreement for RNG. So you can kind of see the progression from the franchise agreement that went into effect a few years, several years ago. Um, and then uh, some creative ways that the city has been able to weave this into um, and make and memorialize these other SB 1383 uh, records. Next slide. Great, so now that we've covered the background and those partnerships uh, that contributed to that record keeping process, I wanna take us to take a, a closer look at the city's actual record. So there are two tools that the city used to put together uh, the implementation record, and that is the CalRecycle model implementation record tool and Excel workbook and Dropbox cloud storage. So two tools that you may look very familiar to you folks. Next slide. So uh, economics, we assisted the city in putting together this record from the, the very beginning. So we use this guiding doc, uh, the, the tool as a guiding doc, and we went tab by tab. If you've opened this up, you know what I'm talking about. It's a, it's a big file. Um, and so tab by tab, we went through to start compiling each of the SB 1383 records. And so um, this allowed for us to annotate with any follow-up items. So items uh, that were complete, partially incomplete, um, the entity responsible for that item. And so that was, uh, that was our first way through, um, in putting, in putting the record together. And so we took that tool and we, uh, mirrored it to the record file system that's stored in Dropbox. So those 15 tabs that you see in the record keeping tool are the 15 folders that you will see in the city's implementation record. And I'll share some screenshots later in the presentation with you all so you can take a, a look at how the city put that together. And then um, one other part of the initial process, um, we talked about the SB 1383 items that are included in the city's franchise agreement. Um, so those reporting elements, we took all those, aggregated all of those and um, placed them into the record. Um, so those were a lot of those 2022 um, records that we started with, and then um, we can we can move to the next slide. And um, similar to the hauler records, um, economics has assisted the city with some other SB 1383 implementation tasks, and we aggregated that documentation, put that into the record as well. And again, to round out this initial, initially putting the record together, we requested any of the missing items after taking everything that we had in existence. Um, we now requested those missing items from the responsible entity. So 
That could be um, additional items from the hauler. Um, that could be, as Kevin mentioned, from multiple city departments um, that he has been able to coordinate and pull records or find uh, locations for those records. And I want to take a, a moment to note here that this has been a, a couple years that we've been working on this and we've been able to increase some efficiencies along the way. And so one of those, uh, one of the ways we do that is to manage documentation, some documentation directly in the record. And for example, economics assist the city with edible food recovery inspections of tier one and tier two generators, food recovery organizations. And the checklists, the photos, any other documentation related to those inspections we'll put directly into the record. Item two there, um, we've also set up a system in which the hauler can submit records directly into the city's record keeping system without granting them full access to all of the files that are in there. And this is a, a Dropbox feature, a file request feature that I'll walk through in the next slide. Next, yeah, thanks. So this is um, what we provided to the hauler um, in that column left there. Again, very tiny text, but I'll walk you through. The, the column on the left has those SB 1383 reporting elements from franchise agreement um, detailed out. Those are what the hauler provided to, provides to the city. And then the columns next to it, 2023, 24, um, and so on by year. We have direct links into the city's Dropbox um, record keeping system. So the hauler can click on that link and then upload those files directly into that specific section in the record. So this just allowed for some increased efficiency. They were uh, submitting the reports in another place or via email. And so now they can submit it directly to the record. Next. And we'll continue on this tour of the city's record keeping system. Um, I mentioned that we've been using this tool, the record keeping tool from CalRecycle as a guiding document. And this allows um, us to be able to annotate, for example, in that little orange box on top, the frequency of the updates needed, um, sections that are not applicable. That's that little gray text that you see in there, the list of high diversion organics facilities. The city doesn't um, doesn't use those, and so we just put not applicable. And we wanted to keep them as placeholders, um, just in case anything changes in the future. In this case, this one will not, um, but there are other sections in which the city may need to um, uh, start uh, maintaining records for some items. And we found that using the tool in this way was very user-friendly. So user-friendly for our staff, user-friendly for the city um, in its review and user-friendly for our LAMD staff as well. So following the CalRecycle site visit that we had earlier this year, we provided them with this record keeping tool, this Excel workbook, and they were able to um, browse through using the checklist that they mentioned and check off um, that each of the items that should be included in the city's record are, are indeed in, in there. Next. Great, and I'll use the last couple slides to show you what the city's record looks like. And um, this is the Dropbox folder that, uh, that houses all of the city's record keeping. Um, you can see in there, we've got that record keeping tool I've been talking about, that Excel workbook. Um, and then you can see this opens up again into that um, rec the record keeping folder with 15 folders there that correspond to that mirror, to that uh, record keeping tool, all those tabs in there. And so the city and economics have full access to all of the folders that you see here. And that's for uploading new records that come from the city end. Kevin can easily do that. Um, our team, if we have inspections, as I mentioned, we can easily put that in the correct place as well. So we try to make it as user-friendly as possible. And next slide. Um, so if we just kind of click through this, since I'm not doing a screen share, I wanted to show with, show you um, what this looks like, like what some of our day-to-day -day looks like in working in this, um, in this record. But this is the waivers and exemptions folder. Um, we've also annotated in here some sections and kept them as uh, placeholders, some sections that are not currently being used by the city. You can see that on the image on the left, not applicable. But those ones that we do use, the waiver protocol, um, the de, min de minimis waivers, physical space constraint. Um, we don't have any of those now, but it's possible that they may come up. So 
um, just again, as user-friendly as possible. And if you click through um, into that first folder, you can see some of the city's records. We've got um, a site visit checklist that the city will use um, when verifying a uh, if a candidate um, is approved or denied for a waiver. We've got applications, protocols, and then finally that last document is the waiver document that is issued to a generator if they're approved. Great, so that takes us through the end of the city's record tour. Uh, if you just float, thank you to that last slide. Thanks y'all for letting us uh, share this with you. There's Kevin um, and my information. And um, yeah, thank you on behalf of the city of Laguna Niguel. Yes, thank you to our speakers from the city of Laguna Niguel. Next, we have a presentation from Culver City. I'd like to introduce Sean Singletary. Sean is the Environmental Programs and Operations Manager for Culver City with over 20 years in various public works roles in Southern California municipalities. He currently oversees environmental and sustainability programs and outreach for the city of Culver City, including recycling, stormwater, sewer overflows, plastic reductions regulations, and other topics. Prior to Culver City, he was sorry, a principal engineer overseeing street and stormwater projects for the city of Pasadena and Vernon. We also have James Pledger. James is the Assistant Environmental Programs and Operations Manager for the city of Culver City with 25 years of experience in overseeing waste and recycling operations with LA County. He currently manages the city's waste and recycling program, including operations for the city's transfer station. Prior to this, James held leadership roles at Republic Services and Waste Management. He began his career in solid waste at the now closed Bradley Landfill in Sun Valley, California. And joining them, we have Judy Gregory. Judy is the president of Go to Zero Strategies, an LA-based solid waste and recycling consulting firm that assists local jurisdictions, haulers, and businesses with legislative compliance and program oversight. She has worked in the industry for 37 years, but began her career in second grade when she began dumpster diving for beverage containers to work to make extra cash. She had previously owned a waste hauling collection firm and served on both the board and as a staff to California Recycling Association for 20 years. She's also the co-founder of Smart Compliance. So please enjoy the presentation from Culver City. Thank you for the introduction, Esmeralda. Uh, as mentioned, we're the city of Culver City, and we will be discussing best practices to set up and maintain an SB 1383 implementation record. Next slide. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, Culver City uh, is a small but busy city on the west side of uh, Los Angeles County. We have just shy of 40,000 residents, as well as a strong local economy, uh, with Sony and Amazon Studios, as well as HBO, um, a large tech presence with companies such as Apple and TikTok uh, and others, as well as uh, many retail service and restaurant businesses. Um, so we're definitely having to give the SB 1383 message to a, a wide array of um, customers. We have over 7,500 residential accounts and approximately 1,300 business trash services subscribers. Uh, we're unique from other agencies in that we are the exclusive franchise hauler for all refuse in the city, and we do not contract with any outside haulers. We do it ourselves. And um, we also own and operate our own 500 ton a day transfer station. Uh, so we have had to add staff both at the operations level and the administration level, um, as well as bring on consultant support with GoToZero to be able to manage the level of reporting uh, and inspection and oversight that SB 1383 requires. So that's what we'll be discussing today. Uh, so now I'm going to kick it over to our um, EPO Assistant Manager, James Pledger. Thank you, Sean. Good afternoon, everyone. If we can go to the next slide, please. So like everyone on this call, at some point in the end of 2020, I believe it was right in the midst of COVID-19, we were all put on notice that SB 1383 was published and Kyle recycled was serious about the legislation. 
I remember the first time he printed out the 86 page document and I was thinking to myself, OMG. Next slide. As Sean indicated, uh, we are unique in the sense that we do 100% of the waste collection for the city. So unlike some of our um, peer cities and other areas, uh, we don't have the opportunity to work with a hauler that has the responsibility of implementing these programs amongst a variety of customers. For us, we had to build out the programs internally. So as we were reading through the documentation, we immediately knew that we were gonna need help, that we were, weren't gonna be able to do this alone. So that uh, concession led to us going through the document line by line, having a realistic uh, talk with ourselves by identifying what we could truly do internally and what aspects of the requirements we would need help with. As a result of those conversations and discussions, uh, it led to us preparing an RFP, which was awarded to go to zero in early 2021. Because this was you know, a large scale project for us and for them as well, we knew that as we built out our plans and our strategies to not only implement the service, but identify the methods that we would use for the, for the tracking of the implementation records, we knew that there had to be flexibility in our plan. From an operational standpoint, we felt that we were on the right path, already having a pre-bin system with a percentage of our commercial customers already participating in our organics program. We just needed to further develop the program by first conducting assessments at each facility. In order to do so, we had to provide GoToZero with our existing data, which we found out through the process had a lot of gaps within itself. So early on in our relationship with GoToZero, a lot of discussions were held on just identifying and resolving the gaps in the data to make sure that we were on the same page with regards to how information would be tracked and kept going forward. In our discussions with GoToZero, we learned that they were in the process of building out their smart portal, which was exactly what the city needed at that time to help assist us with our implementation record tracking. Next slide, please. Because there are so many records that were required to be kept, it was important to assign different team members with certain aspects of the record keeping requirements to make sure we had good oversight and held one another accountable to ensure that the flow of information was happening timely. As we learned working with the two that capacities were continuing to expand, uh, we needed to make sure that we kept the lines of communication open as people who were utilizing the tools identified glitches that needed to be resolved and worked out throughout the process. Some of the challenges that we faced was the ease of tracking and keeping photos, social media and posts, and other forms of data that would be needed for the record keeping process outside of just basic customer information. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, if you can go back a slide, please. Some of the biggest challenges that we faced was just not knowing what we didn't know at the time with regards to what level of detail was needed for the record implementation process. Other challenges we had was the lack of being able to access information from both internal and external uh, stakeholders due to them not being totally on board with the regulation due to the lack of information that was available to them at the time and just people being resistant to change. We ready for the next slide? Yeah, next slide, please. 
Okay, so uh, our our first step um, when creating these internal processes was um, to create them and uh, also to implement the documents for tracking and reporting. Uh, we prepared written program descriptions for items like waste assessment requests, written program investigations, um, our own hauler program, waivers and exemptions, um, food recovery, annual reporting, uh, and more. We also set up an online complaint form, which allows uh, folks to submit concerns both anonymously and also uh, with the option to get uh, a report back from the city. Um, so far, we've we've just received one complaint. Um, we created outreach materials for our route reviews, uh, for general information, uh, and also specific uh, to certain disciplines such as uh, edible food generators. Uh, we created forms for waivers, inspections, and notices of violation should we reach that point. Uh, we've had to update our permits and contracts internally to include verbiage uh, for landscapers, for third-party organics haulers, uh, such as um, fat, oil, and grease collectors, um, and edible food generators and food recovery organizations. And uh, we continued updating our purchasing policy and identified recovered organics vendors. Next slide. So there are going uh, to be several stakeholders that uh, will have access to the data in the city's case. Uh, we have all the records from accounts we serve to maintain, plus third-party organics haulers, our consultants, uh, and various city departments, tier one and tier two generators, food recovery organizations, uh, and other facilities. Mm -hmm. In addition to being organized with compiling the IR, um, we had to have a process uh, of who does what and when, as it uh, can get to be a lot of information um, that can get very quickly disorganized. Um, the written program descriptions previously mentioned each have a section on record keeping requirements uh, and help determine who is responsible for directly entering the records um, and who would provide the records um, if requested. Um, this is important because if we have uh, too many uh, folks accessing the folder, we may end up with um, lost information or um, data that uh, has been scrambled somehow. Um, so we make a point to identify who the point person is um, and who's overseeing um, completion and accuracy. Um, and, and luckily, we've been able to build out our staff to uh, assign those roles um, appropriately. So now I'm going to kick the presentation over to Judy Gregory from GoToZero. Thanks, Sean. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so thanks, Sean and James. Um, I think the big takeaway from what they shared is that this doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot of planning and preparation that goes into, um, you know, this before you even get to the, the the part where you're going to start organizing it into a record. And so just as a, a background, um, I'm sure most everybody knows this, but the implementation record is a single central storage location. It can be either physical or electronic for storing your records. Um, and when CalRecycle does commence the compliance review um, and they provide notification, you only have 10 days to produce this, this um, uh, record keeping system. So you don't have a lot of time. You don't wanna start when you get the notice. Um, and the other thing is, is that it's just really like a living document. This isn't something that you do once a year. It's something that's ongoing. All records should be uh, current within 60 days of the creation of the record or information. And you're gonna need to retain it for a long time. So really having a system in place that's gonna meet all of those needs is what you're 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 wanting to do. So next slide, please. Um, and this slide just gives you a, a taste of how much information you're going to be tracking. It's a lot. So organization is key. And I think if there's one message throughout this, um, Kim did a great job. You know, that organization, it takes extra time in the beginning. It's going to be so worth it uh, because it's really going to make a long term success. Um, and, and things much easier. Um, as you can imagine that within each of these sections, you're going to have, you know, dozens, maybe hundreds of documents, thousands of lines, you know, millions of data points. So getting this right from the beginning is important. 
you know, as an example, we, for our annual report, we log into logic and we might be asked a number, number of de minimis waivers, boom. This system is very different. You're not just putting in the number of waivers. You're going to be maintaining an independent record keeping system. We're gonna have all those details about the waivers. Who applied for them? How were they assessed? Um, were they approved or not? Backup supporting documentations like photos or notations from the auditors. Who audited them? Who approved them? What are the dates that they're approved for? So it's a lot of data points versus a single point, which we're kind of used to doing. So next slide, please. Um, so gonna keep stressing this, how do we wanna organize it? Um, we, in the city of Culver City, we're using the SMART system. Prior to the SMART system, we were organizing a lot of documents, very similar to what was presented earlier using shared drives. We use Google. Um, you can do a lot of the same things within a shared drive system and using data spreadsheets as you can as a formal system. Um, there are some benefits, though, and other things that you can do. But the goal is to organize information in a manner that's easy to track and easy for CalRecycle to review. So imagine you're looking for a document in your folder that you created a couple of years ago. And where did I put that thing? And you're searching and you're searching and you can't find it. It's your own storage folder. It's your own storage system. Um, we're going to be providing this document to CalRecycle, who doesn't know how our brains work and how we organize things. So I don't know if they're going to give us extra brownie points, but the goal is to make sure that when they get it, they understand how to find what they're looking for. So we want the document to be, or the storage system to be comprehensive. It should contain all of the information that is the full extent and reflection of the programs and activities that you're doing within your city and it definitely needs to be well organized. So next slide, please. Um, this is a document that maybe some of you have seen. I've shared it a few times, um, but this is just a, a, a way to help organize at a high level. This is, I think, a seven page document. It has about a hundred lines and it just helps organize each of the different requirements within the regulations to record keep, where those regulations are in the reg so that you can find them if you need to refer back. Um, you can organize who's doing it. Um, I like to use color coding and lots of different things just to, to notate, you know, what's a red flag, what are we doing good on, what's maybe a little outdated. Um, and then this is a great way if you are using shared folders to link over to those folders themselves via that file name uh, folder. So next slide, please. And then, um, you know, just the, how do you track and maintain all of these documents? So James said it, the data, the photos, the URLs, the social media posts, all of those files. Starting with um, organization at the root level, so file naming conventions. I saw that on the the prior presenter, you know, some great um, file naming conventions so that things follow a logic so that you know where they go and people know what section they're provided to. So maybe it starts with the, the section in the IR and a descriptive file name, the date that it was updated. Um, these are all things that will help you find and organize. We like to use a lot of mapping tools. So we also not only maintain the city's implementation record, but we do um, a, a large portion of their outreach. Um, so having systems where we can go from the map to our surveys and tools is very helpful. And then using good survey tools. Um, we're going to be sharing a little bit more about the smart system, but, you know, Google has a lot of great survey tools. Microsoft does. Um, I strongly recommend using survey tools just so that you can have consistent inputs and information that make it easy to organize and to sort. Um, use conditional formatting and VLOOKUPs with your spreadsheets, color coding, filters and lots of sorting options. And one of my favorite um, uses is just of URLs. And I'm gonna share that with you in a few of the um, slides coming up, just how um, easy it is to do a lot of the record keeping when you're using a URL system. So next slide, please. Um, this is an example. It's my last example of more of a spreadsheet form before we get into the smart system. But um, this might have been a link to a spreadsheet. This is for education and outreach. 
And again, kind of using that model of the Cal Recycle Toolkit, where you know the data points that they want to collect, you can create spreadsheets that have all of these. You can actually create a survey that feeds into this, where you upload the documents through a survey, or you can do this manually. Either way, um, I like to use, again, the URL, so that link to file column F um, contains a URL that will take you straight over to that document or to that location. So example, line six is actually, it's taking you to a Facebook post versus a file. Um, so just really um, unique ways that you can use URLs to help organize the data. And then, um, you know, link from one file to another without having to go in and out of files um, and in and out of uh, opening those documents. So next slide, please. So as we mentioned, the city is using the SMART system, and we're going to follow a lot of that same logic. So there's those organized uh, sections within the IR. Because the city has a full SMART system and not just the IR, there are, there's two options, a full system that tracks all of the, the generator data, or there's an IR standalone. The city uses a full system. So actually, this is a huge time saver. A lot of the documents go straight into the IR. Um, as the auditors are doing um, work in the field. So waivers, route reviews, inspections, notices of violations, complaints. Whenever that's done in the generator file, it automatically pushes to the IR and there's no double touching it. But then there are several things um, that have to be maintained um, that aren't going through the generator. So next slide, we'll go through a quick tour of just a few of the high level um, things within the system. So this is an example of organization. You want to keep organization easy as you would go. This is our written program description. So to make sure that you don't miss a written program description, you would go in and see a drop down. You're going to want to make sure that you have a document for each of these. It allows you to put a title, notes, the effective date or the date that it was adopted. Um, and then you can either link over to the file. Uh, upload a file, or you can upload a URL to the file, whichever is easier. Next slide, please. And I'm going to go through these really quick. Another thing that I like to do is make sure that our forms calculate automatically if possible. So this is just an example of how our recycled organics waste procurement allows you to input the different product types. So that product has a drop down of several different allowable material types. You input the quantity and it automatically converts that to the equivalent of, uh, of um, material compost. And then you can go to the next slide. And actually, once you input the record, it tracks what percentage of the target you've met for your year. So you can always see where you are in uh, meeting your target goals. Next slide, please. And then I talked about URLs. Love to use URLs, especially for education and outreach. Um, you can upload an Instagram or a Facebook link or a link to your city website or your hauler website. Um, and that way, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that um, as you upload those, when CalRecycle goes in to look at them, if they click on them, you know, the, the left one is linking over to their haulers, a hauler website, not this city, this is a different city. Um, uh, the middle one links over to a social media post and even the last one links over to um, a folder, a shared folder. So this is from our demo site, but um, you can see that there's lots of different ways to store the information. Next slide, please. Just a couple more slides. Um, the other thing is photos and notifications are also maintained as URLs, which also means that if you export these in Excel or a CSV, that you're still going to be able to see those photos and notifications through the URL link. So that's another great reason to use URLs is that as you're storing data on um, uh, database files or like spreadsheets that you're able to still open those up easily. Next slide, please. Um, and for Cal Recycle, it's easy access. They have their own uh, login where they will click these next slide and it will each section opens up the records that they're able to see. And then within those records, it's a data table and they have access to all the records, including those photos and links that will open up. Um, next slide, please. And each of the record tables, they're able to filter, they can, they can um, check or uncheck columns that they want to see or not see, and then export this information. And then next slide. 
Um, and then they also have a place to track notes for the sections that we're reviewing and add those um, as part of feedback for the city. Next slide. I think that's it. Yeah. So that's it on our record keeping tool. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'm going to pass it back to Calvary Cycle. Thank you, Judy. Uh, with Go to Zero Strategies, that was a great presentation. Um, and thank you also to Sean and James for your um, presentations from City of Culver City. And with that, I am going to welcome our next speaker. Um, it is Wendy Nelson with um, Sacramento County. Wendy Nelson is a Waste Management Program Manager 1 with Sacramento County's Department of Waste Management and Recycling, overseeing the residential planning and special waste. And with that, please help me welcome Wendy. Hi, thank you so much uh, for having me here. I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. Um, like like uh, I was introduced, I'm Wendy Nelson, um, work with Sacramento County, and we are in the Department of Waste Management and Recycling. So um, go ahead to the next slide. Can you go? Yeah, there you go. Um, just a little introduction um, about Sacramento County. Uh, we actually own and operate the North Area Recovery Station, which is a transfer facility up by McClellan Air Force Base. Um, we own and operate the Kiefer Landfill, and we also have drop-off facilities for household hazardous waste. We have an HHW facility, and we also have an ABOT facility. We have um, we oversee a regulation of the commercial solid waste and recycling requirements for both business um, and multifamily properties. And then we also provide residential services. Um, we have about 160,000 uh, residential customers and we provide curbside service of their three ma main commodities, which would be the recycling garbage and organics. And um, that is for uh, residents in Sacramento County unincorporated area. Next slide. So what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna to talk about some of the challenges that we have faced trying to put together the implementation records so that we meet um, compliance requirements. I also want to talk about our approach that we took for um, uh, meeting those expectations. I want to talk a little bit about our file system, how we set it up, and then how we assigned responsibilities, and then an overall how we um, maintain coordination with uh, the record keeping and making sure that it's um, there, it's all the requirements that we have are being complied with. So next slide. So Initially, when we were trying to figure out how we were going to put all this together, um, we we had some challenges. Um, first off was all the records have to be uh, maintained. And so that first challenge was just trying to identify what records were required and how were we going to get a hold of them all. Um, another challenge that we faced was, was having them all in one central location. So um, we were trying to figure out, do we, do we keep it with our department? Do we have it um, in paper? form? Do we do an electronic form? So those were just some challenges that we we're trying to work through. We also, one of the biggest challenges is the 10-day requirement. So in the event that the Cower Cycle contacts us and says that they're going to do an audit, um, those files, we, we, we're, we've got 10 days to make sure our files are up to date. So um, that we have not been faced with that yet, but we are anticipating that, that challenge and um, making steps so that we will meet those expectations. Um, another challenge was the uh, 60 days. So within 60 days of any of those records that we're required to have, they have to be in the file. That's that's one of the requirements. And this is definitely a living document. One of the other presenters had mentioned that. So then like for um, any time a document is created, it could be a purchasing document and it could be an inspection document. Any document whatsoever has to be in the file. So that was a really big challenge as well. And then it wasn't so much a challenge, but there's when we were making our decisions about how to set this up, we um, were aware of the five-year requirement of how long we have to keep our, our, our files uh, maintained. Next slide, please. So management put together a team so that the first thing we did was had some internal meetings to try to determine um, where to start. Uh, what do we need to do? What kind of resources did we have? What kind of process we wanted to put together? Um, and who was going to be involved with that. Um, 
And that involved internal meetings with our Department of Waste Management and Recycling. So it was in our office that we were trying to make those decisions. One of the first decisions we made was identifying that the Cal Recycle Model um, implementation tool was going to be, um, we, were going, we were going to use that, but we we're going to modify it so that it was best suited to our individual needs. Um, one of the things that we did was because of the five-year requirement, we set it up um, on a calendar year. That's the way our files are set up. And um, they're, so they're by calendar year. And you'll see that in, uh, I'll show you some slides as we go along. Another thing is that we are currently working on a, uh, a network. So that's how we have set our files up. Um, and we set them up so that we would all be able to independently access those files. Um, especially there's so much information and we wanted, we didn't want to have any conflicts as far as people getting into that, um, into those files. And we also are looking into, or we're in the process, I should say, of moving into an M365 um, SharePoint cloud-based system. So that is going to change in the future how we set our files up. Hopefully we'll make things uh, better. And then lastly, we set up some external meetings with our other departments who are uh, not only with our internal staff who um, have access to the documents that we needed to put in this implementation record, but also other departments who have that information. And we met with them, explained our, our issue, what we needed, and um, strategies on how to make sure that we were able to access that information. Uh, and that was specifically general services that has our procurement documents, uh, EMD, which has a, our environmental management department, which would have inspection information, and they have some outreach information, and also code enforcement, who would do any kind of um, uh, inspections or vi violation um, uh, um, or enforcement type of documents. So, um, all right, next slide. So this is a screenshot of how we set the files up. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we did it by calendar year, so um, I'm going to be using 2023 Sacramento County implementation record. I'm going to use that one as kind of an example when as we go along and basically just set it up by year. And then we have another file. The fourth one down is the file folder system with our assigned personnel. So any um, information that uh, pertains to who is responsible, what they're responsible for, any kind of emails, that all goes in there. And then we also have a spreadsheet that I'll share with you later. Um, and it it identifies um, the items that need to be completed and then the person who's gonna be in charge or the department that's in charge of getting that information together. And then lastly, I've just got a resources file, which is just a catch-all for um, this, uh, this entire um, implementation record. So uh, any emails or resources whatsoever would go into that, that file. All right, next slide. So this is, um, this is just the way that we set up our folder system so that uh, number one, uh, the same person who's um, in the edible food records, for example, may, may not need to get into the recycled paper. So this way, the way we've got it set up, multiple people can be accessing those folders at the same time if, if they needed to. And then these folders all correlate to the, to the Cow Recycle Model tool, except the tabs. So the Cow Recycle Model tool is just a, a really big um, Excel spreadsheet. So we decided to just break it up into these folders with the same with the same names. Um, and then the top file that you see, it's a 2023 resources. Once again, any kind of emails, any kind of um, useful information that is specific to 2023, but perhaps not specific to an individual folder. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to grab one of these folders. I'm going to go into the enforceable mechanisms records. And in the next slide, we'll just pop that open. So next slide, please. So as you can see with the, I'll use my mouse. Uh, you can see up here, it's our SB 1383 implementation record. It's for 2023 Sacramento County implementation record. And it's um, the enforceable mechanisms records. So if you open that folder, this is what you're going to see. So these folders right here, one through seven, those are specific folders for our um, for our county and what we put in this file. So if you uh, open any one of those folders, you'll be able to access the information that you need. Now the bottom one is an actual, um, that is the tab from the Cal Recycle Model tool and it is specific for the uh, enforceable mechanisms records. So when, you, when you're in the folder, you have all your documents that are organized, but then you also have um, the, 
the cow recycle model tool spreadsheet that you can use and almost we almost use it as like a cover sheet so it's got um, any additional information really specific to us before i go into that 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 file right there i want to show you um, another uh, slide so let's go to the next slide so this is the this is that same 2023 sac county implementation record it's the it's the folder for the edible food re recovery records it's built very similarly to the enforcement one I just showed you, where it's got number one through six, which is very specific to Sacramento County and our needs, but it's still got that cow recycle model tool, that, that tab that was taken from the Excel spreadsheet for the edible food recovery. A couple of things that I want you to note is that number one, even though it's a folder, even though it's set up, it says edible food county code, but it there's actually nothing in that folder. It is telling you that you can go back to the enforceable mechanism records and that's where that document is held. So it's a complete um, picture of our edible food record, edible food recovery information, but it's gonna guide you somewhere else to get that document. That way we don't have a bunch of duplicate documents where you have the potential to make mistakes. It's just in that um, enforceable mechanism record. And I also did it for the second one. Once again, there's a folder for edible food MOU and regional agreement but we already have those in the enforcement mechanism record. So we just kept it there and just made a note. Um, and then once again, that bottom uh, link will bring you to that um, power cycle model tool. Um, some of the reason why we did the files the way we did is that uh, anybody, if we have, if we're called in to have an audit, then regardless of who is maybe in the office um, or available can kind of step in and help with this process. Um, and that's why those little notes on like number one and number two would be really helpful. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Okay, so this one, this this image should be familiar to everyone. And this is taken straight from the cow recycle model tool. That's just the tab that would say enforceable mechanisms. And um, I did kind of condense it a little so it would fit on the slide really well and you can see it. But basically this is this is what we're using, that final um, uh, file entry in each one of those folders so that we can be able to identify all the regulatory references and the information that is provided by Cal Recycle. So we use this like a cover sheet. So, um, and this is, uh, this is just taken from the Cal Recycle tool. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we've taken um, that that uh, that image or that spreadsheet from the Cow Recycle tool, and then we modified it to meet our needs better. So uh, we added links so you can, if you need the county code for that first item in this in the spreadsheet, you can just click on that link and it will bring you back to that folder. Um, I just try to make it as simple as possible. Like I said, if there is um, someone in the office that needs to help out with the audit who may not be that familiar with it. So we just tried to make it as, as a clean and easy as possible. Um, and once again, this would be our cover sheet for that folder. Uh, so it would try, we try to make it easy if we did get an audit that, that the um, in, inspectors or the auditors could look at this easily try to identify what they want to look at, and we just click on the link and then we can get them to the information they're, they're looking for. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is how we assigned responsibilities. So initially at those meetings, once we identified where the records were, who had them, and then who would be the best person or department to provide those documents to us. So once again, on the left-hand side, we've got our categories, our file names, and those all correlate um, specifically with the folders and with the tabs in the cow recycle model uh, tool. So um, you'll see in some of these, it's our office, which is DWMR. So that would be a staff person that was assigned to it. And like we have code and EMD and DGS, so we're also responsible for um, different documents and uh, we'll put their names in there and then any notes, any specific notes. So that's been, this has been very, very um, useful. Okay, next slide. And then as far as the coordination, we have one person who's responsible for maintaining the implementation schedule, just kind of uh, facilitating that. And then a lot of other people are responsible for actually providing the information, uh, either staff or departments. Um, and the way that we maintain communication on this is just emails throughout the year, 
the person facil the person who's um, responsible for maintaining the file will say, hey, you know, we're, we're looking for some files. We notice that they're not in there. Could you send them over? We have um, agreements with some of the other departments that they will send the files over to an inbox or an email uh, on a regular basis. So once those come in, we just put them in there. And then also some of the um, some of the records are that's that's where they're kept on a regular basis. Um, we also have um, periodic reports that are pulled from our different databases that we have, um, databases that we have internally in, in, our, in our department, but also there's databases that other um, departments have. So they'll pull a record, send it to us, and then we put it in. So, um, and we regularly talk about this, like in our staff meetings, we'll bring it up, especially when it's a, when it's a timely, um, on like an annual basis, um, it'll be brought up as a status update or, um, or uh, or through emails, either us just reminding people or us actually requesting information. Um, so Department of General Services, we had a meeting with them originally and we all just decided that they would just be sending us um, periodic emails and they've been great about that. So they'll send us all any kind of um, certifications or invoices or information that they have about procurement. So they forward it to us and we put it into the, into the, um, the folder in the appropriate folder. Um, with EMD and code, we actually have MOUs or uh, memorandum of understanding with them. And in those MOUs that we already have with them, we've added this language um, that within 10 days upon request, they'll provide that information to us. So we can always ask them like periodically uh, to provide us that information. But in the event that there is an audit, then the expectation is that within 10 days that they, they'll be able to provide that to us. Um, and I think that's it. Next slide. Um, for questions, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to um, answer them or talk to you. Um, we have the Q&A, so I think that they're going to hold off on uh, responding till the end. So with that, just next slide, I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity, and I hope uh, you found that helpful. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Wendy, for your presentation on behalf of Sacramento County. Next, I'd like to introduce James Roska, presenting for the City of LA. James is the Acting Environmental Engineer in LA Sanitation Solid Resource Support Service Division. He manages refuse, organics, and special waste collection, op operations planning, and contracting for material collected from 750,000 single-family households. James oversaw the implementation of Organics LA, the curbside organic waste recycling program for LA San serviced household and is one of the implementation leads for the city's SB 1383 team. Sorry, was I muted? You were. There we Perfect. go. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is James Roska. I'm one of the City of LA's implementation, re, uh, implementation leads. And my presentation today is going to be a little different than our prior jurisdiction, um, as I'm going to kind of physically walk you through how we've set up our implementation record. Uh, for some quick background on the City of Los Angeles, just to give kind of scope on how our operations manage, um, LA Sanitation and the city are responsible for the single family household collections. So we service approximately 750,000 single family households, small multifamily complexes, typically four units or less, as well as a number of city facilities. And then in addition to the residential collection, we have our exclusive franchise program, Recicla, which oversees all of the commercial collections. So servicing approximately 65,000 commercial accounts which encompass medium and large multifamily complexes, condominiums, and commercial businesses. Similar to many of the other jurisdictions, one of the challenges or really things that we need to tackle up front was identifying all of the various aspects of the implementation record, um, the implementation of the various articles within SB 1383, and identifying where all of those different activities were housed whether it was within LA Sanitation's operations or other city departments. Um, so throughout the entire rec uh, rulemaking process, as well as then implementation, uh, we had a pretty much ongoing monthly meeting of various divisions within sanitation in the city, 
Um, at one point, our implementation team was as large as 50 members who were basically all directly involved in either operating, managing, or overseeing some aspect of SB 1383. So you can see kind of how large and how widely spread all of our um, departments and operations are split throughout sanitation especially. One of the main challenges we also identified is throughout all of these programs, record keeping was done or managed through a number of different systems either through internal reports that were managed by individual divisions, um, larger systems that were already established for programs such as our commercial franchise um, oversight, and new spreadsheets and new documentations and records that we needed to really identify and create new places to house that information. So for our program, we used uh, Google Drive. So the city is already on the Google Enterprise system. So that's where all of our mailing operations, the, uh, Google Drive, it's fully integrated into basically how we already communicate and organize things within the city. And we particularly use Google Shared Drives. And one of the main things that drove us to use Google Shared Drives was the basically the ability for all of the documents to be owned by the city as an overall system, as opposed to individual email accounts. Um, with how large of a department we are and how many folks are working on these various programs, there's also a lot of potential for um, people moving departments, promoting, transferring, um, taking on new responsibilities, handing responsibilities off to other folks. So rather than having files and documents owned by individuals through the normal Google Drive system, the Google Share Drive allows everyone to kind of have equal ownership and to be able to add and remove new participants into the Google Share Drive as needed. Um, I am going to show, um, our implementation record tool. And this was actually built and shared to us originally by Judy Gregory. So uh, you may see that this looks very similar to the tool that was shared for Culver City. Um, but we have similarly made some adjustments or some modifications to meet um, our jurisdiction's unique needs. Um, I think organization is, and as well as um, visual clarity was a key thing that we wanted to, to have at the beginning of setting up our system. So really color coordinating a lot of tasks and being able to visually track where we are at in the process of basically moving these documents from their existing locations into our formal implementation record, which is the Google Drive folder that you saw previously. Um, in addition to that, um, I think there was a lot of discussion about this being a living document or many aspects of it being a living document. So we really wanted to identify which items or pieces of information were static so, you know, it was either an ordinance or a document or a program narrative that could be written and uploaded once versus documents that are kind of more living and need to be either queried, um, pulled from another data source, or frequently updated as the program is ongoing. And another tool to really make that uh, easier for us to manage is using a lot of things like conditional formatting that can add some of that visual data um, and visual ease of interpreting where you're at with your data. Uh, in addition to this implementation tool, um, I think uh, the previous presenter mentioned having this as kind of a cover sheet. Um, we're using this in a very similar way to have to serve as a cover sheet for all of the various documents and aspects of the implementation record. Um, we similarly also use uh, URLs to be able to link to individual folder locations and even to directly to individual files. So you can see that these are easily accessible and viewable as previews. And then you can also then open up uh, these documents into the actual Google uh, folder or Google file that's housed onto the Google Drive folder. Uh, in addition to that, let me see, I'm having trouble moving tabs back. There we go. Uh, in addition to that, we did also make sure to identify who are the specific point of contact. So, um, within the city who is responsible for housing that information. Um, the good thing about this being integrated into our Google system is that it also does provide contact information so you can readily contact, communicate, chat with, with individuals who are maintaining those specific records. We've also added additional notes um, into this kind of notes or comments column, um, both as internal reminders for where a specific piece of data can be um, either queried or pulled from, or some additional clarifying data that we can provide to Cal Recycle. And then I just wanted to show kind of a quick um, digging into the actual folder structure. 
Um, again, within the record tool, you can jump straight to any specific file or document that you're looking for, any specific section, but you can also um, go through the individual folders. You'll see that we've matched the folder naming system as well as the numbering system to kind of match both the CalRecycle record implementation tool, um, as well as some of the um, numbering or organization that we already had from Judy Gregory's starting uh, spreadsheet. Uh, we did also work to number um, using subsections to kind of keep track of where information is. And similarly, as this record continues to grow, using different numbering systems or nomenclature to indicate when the information was queried or if it's covering a specific date range or specific uh, portion of, of our service. So for one example, this is our route review data. So you can see um, this is uh, query, this is a report that's queried from a GIS mobile application that was developed by our GIS team. And we're at any time able to basically query the information um, for a specific date range. So for example, this spreadsheet was queried for the month of May and it has all of the information and in some cases additional information um, to what's being required for the route review data. Um, one of the challenges or one of the things we're still working out is the ability to have um, photos linked in, which we do have on the um, on the GIS system itself, but haven't yet been able to spit it out into this spreadsheet format. Um, so I think Judy had a, a great point about being able to find a way to link individual URLs um, if, those, uh, if those photos or other documents are housed on other uh, web systems as opposed to having to be exported. So that's all that I have. My, presentation is a little bit different than our previous presenters, but I think we've, we've had uh, many similar challenges and uh, basically things that we had to work through in terms of preparing this, this spreadsheet. And I think really it's just a lot of organization, coordination, and just keeping on top of um, how up-to-date your information is. And with that, um, here is my information. And I think we will turn it over to the overall Q&A for all the presenters. Awesome. Thank you so much, James. It was really helpful to get to see some examples of an implementation record. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and start the Q&A session. Um, oh, thank you for sharing the guidelines, Darren. So um, th these are our guidelines for our Q&A session. We're asking people to please place their questions in the Q&A pane rather than putting them in the chat it just makes it much easier for the webinar team to keep track of questions and keep them all going in a queue um, if you're unable to find the q and a um, pane it there should be a button for it down at the bottom of your zoom screen it may be hidden under the button that says more and has three dots on it so if you're having difficulties finding it check the dot check the three dot button that says more um, so we will do our best to get to as many different questions as possible, although I see at least one in here that I think is probably going to lead to a longer discussion. Um, we, But we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, when I get to your question, I will find your name in our participant list and ask you to unmute. If you have any difficulty doing so, that's okay. I can always read your question for you, but we do prefer to have participants read their questions themselves as much as possible. Um, and if you're having difficulty unmuting, you can also submit your question to us via email. Um, if you can't find the Q&A pane, this also works. The email is here on your screen, slcp dot organics at calrecycle.ca.gov. And one thing we're doing this time that is a little bit different from our previous SB 1383 chat with Cal Recycles is we are allowing anonymous questions this time. So if you have something you want to ask anonymously um, without ac potentially accidentally calling yourself out for having a non-compliant portion of your implementation record, you can absolutely do that. Just please bear in mind that we won't be able to follow up on those questions later if you submit it anonymously. And with that, I am going to go to our first open question, which is from Jasmine Haddon. 
Jasmine, you should be able to unmute. Please go ahead and unmute yourself, ask your question, and then we will go ahead and answer it. Hi, I'm with the city of Monrovia and when doing our inspections, an edible food generator asked what the retention policy was on their documents. I checked the regulations and couldn't find how many years and I was wondering if it would just be the same for them as it is for us, five years, or if they weren't required to keep all of the individual documents that aren't on the record keeping requirements. So multi-layered question, but just wondering what you guys had to say about that. Yes, if there's anyone else on the team who is able to answer that question, um, please hop, hop in. in here. Thanks, Marshall. Thank you, Katie. Um, great question. And I think we're going to get quite a few questions that we're not going to know exactly the answers to. And these, this, gonna, this is going to help us inform creating some related uh, questions and answers that we uh, provide in follow-up. So this is one, I think we're all clear on what the requirement for retention is um, for the jurisdictions, but I don't know if that extends or there's other requirements for record keeping for the edible food recovery um, organizations. So that's definitely one that we can circle back. And one of the reasons uh, I wanna, guess I wanna share the process that we go through. So when we have these questions, we do our very best um, programmatically to come up with a response. And they often need to be vetted with our legal office so that we are uh, you know, sure about the accuracy of the information that we're giving you um, considering the question. So uh, we may have more than just this one that fit this scenario, but I don't want that to keep us from asking questions because these are great questions. Thank you. All right, I just took a quick look through the regulations and I'm having difficulties finding this as well. But we have your email through the registration system on Zoom, and we can follow up with you uh, about this after the meeting, Jasmine. Thank you. All right. And that is all the open questions we have now. So I am going to go through our answered questions, which all of our participants should be able to see in the Q&A pane. But I'm going to go through some of these just to be able to um, to be able to have a little additional discussion on them. So the first one is going to be from uh, B. Geta, who asked Culver City what system or program they use for Smart 1383. And Judy Gregory actually answered that on their behalf. They said she says Culver City uses the Smart. 1383 system, which is its own record keeping system specifically designed for SB 1383 record keeping. Um, does anyone from Culver City have anything to add to that? Maybe Sean or James, if you have any more details that might be helpful. No, I think that that cleared it up. All right, sounds good. Uh, next, our next question was from Zinzi Tan who asked Judy Gregory, how often do you go through and clean up broken links? Is there a way to find broken links? And um, Judy, would you like to go ahead and address your, your answer to that? Sure, yeah, that was actually a really good question. That is one of the challenges with using URLs if you're pointing to pages on a website or um, files in a shared folder um, through a URL system is that when that information changes, um, that URL link might become broken. Another good example is oftentimes when we're um, referring to the um, ordinance, we'll use the city's online muni code lookup and just link right over to the city's muni code. But if that ever changes, again, you have that broken link. So what we can do is um, through the systems, we can do a periodic um, export of the URLs that are being saved. And we basically run it through like a validation that double checks if the URLs are actually still valid. And if they're not, then we can provide a list of um, broken URLs so that those can be updated in the system or replaced with um, uh, 
a, like a PDF or an actual copy of a document to replace that prior record. Nice, thank you, Judy. All right, and our next question was from an anonymous participant who was asking, how are jurisdictions meeting paper procurement requirements in a non-centralized purchasing environment, i.e., how do jurisdictions that have multiple departments slash staff with purchasing authority ensure that paper purchases meet recycled paper content and store these receipts? Policies only go so far. And Sean Singletary with the city of Culver City um, says that their finance department enforces the environmental purchase environmental purchasing policy and assist in getting word to all departments about what is required by SB 1383 for their paper, for mulch and compost procurement, etc. They also approve all invoices and purchase orders and can flag purchases at that point. Getting coworkers within one's jurisdiction into compliance can be just as challenging as residents and businesses. Um, and that's something that I, I am aware some other jurisdictions have been dealing with. Um, so I don't know if anyone else, uh, if any of our other presenters have decentralized purchasing systems and would care to add to Sean's response perhaps. Um, any Anything and everything helps, I think. It's decentralized purchasing can be a real sticking point. Anybody? Um, Zinzi, I'm just going to ask you to unmute real quick. Um, I'm not sure at what point you raised your hand is one of the challenges with using the hand raise function in Zoom. Um, but please go ahead and, and um, ask your question or add your comment. Thanks, Katie. Yes, so I raised my hand just now when um, you had talked about Judy's answer to my question about the broken links. And I was just curious for the other jurisdictions that don't use Smart 1383, if they have their own system and they, you know, link to, say, like a social media post and it's just in Google Drive or whatever they're using, like a SharePoint. Um, if there's a system for them to figure out broken links and how often they comb through for that. Ah, okay. I am going to lower Zinzi's hand so that I can keep track of hands raising. And if anybody would like to add to that, please go ahead and use the hand raise function. Uh, it should be under the react button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And I'm going to give another few seconds to see if anyone has something to add. You can also add things anonymously into the Q&A pane, which it looks like a few folks have uh, done. So I am going to go ahead and go back over to the open questions pane. And our first open question is from Corey Beaver. Corey, I'm going to go ahead and enable you to unmute. Please unmute yourself and state your affiliation and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, my apologies. So, yeah, we were talking about the topic of retention for the implementation record um, previously. How many years do we need to keep documents um, on record to provide to Cal Recycle. Some of the route reviews and other documents that we have compiled can be rather substantial, um, especially if we're keeping it in a paper format and just trying to figure out kind of the benefit of keeping documents year over year over year. That's another really good question. Um, so there is a requirement to maintain the records for five years. So that's how long you would need to keep any given record. When we do a compliance evaluation and ask for access to the implementation record, that's going to be the data that you're going to provide is going to be um, from that date of when it's asked all the way back um, 
through five years. We don't have five years yet of SB 1383 implementation records. So right now, when the team is going out to do those evaluations, they're looking at 2022, 2023, and what we have of 2024. So it'll always be the year um, that the evaluation's being done and then going back um, up to five years. Okay, and again, you said you're starting at 2022. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, yeah. All right, thank you, Corey. Our next question is from Billy Miller. Billy, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Please go ahead and unmute and tell us your affiliation and ask your question. Hi, I'm Billy. I work with a hauler and um, I specifically work with 12 to 15 other jurisdictions. And we've been having lots of conversations recently about the implementation record and going over the tools. And I think a really important start for them would be to start writing out these program descriptions. So I'm just wondering if anybody would be willing to peer share just an example of like how in depth others are going with these types of um, descriptions, how detailed they are, and kind of the format that they're using. All right. Um, Judy, please go ahead. Great. Yeah, thank you. So that's a really good question. We've, we've, um, We've had those conversations and uh, sometimes the less is more, but I um, err on the side that these should be very descriptive. Um, in our experience, having gone through already a compliance review with CalRecycle, um, they use these documents. They review them almost um, initially to look at how our programs are set up within a city. So to really understand um, you know, who oversees it, who's doing certain aspects of it, how you're keeping those records. So um, in our in our cities that we work in, um, we have several that we've helped develop these for. We have a pretty standard format. Um, imagine that these are not just internal documents, but um, sometimes they're going through the city's review process up through um, a, a chain. And so really starting at the base, we start each written program description with a reiteration of the regulation, regulatory requirements, so that whoever is reviewing it understands that, okay, this is coming from the regulations. And then we'll have another section that, and here's the city policy, because we know that sometimes the city policy changes um, or is slightly different from the regulations. Typically, you know, that would be more um, uh, strict or more requirements than the regulatory requirements. So we'll pull the city code and put that there. And then the extensive piece is the how you're actually doing it, how and who. So um, we put an entire protocol or process together that pieces of it. So if it's route reviews, um, you know, who's responsible to do them? How often are they being done? Um, what's the system for collecting the data? How is that data? Um, reviewed, um, you know, your process for internal reviews, um, uh, how is the information then disseminated back to the generator? So we include all those details. And then the last section is the record keeping section that identifies how the records are maintained, possibly a link back to some of those files or folders, or where to find that within the record keeping document. So it's a really comprehensive um, description of everything in there. Um, and I think the most important piece to it is that you want to ima imagine that at a city, uh, if the person that's, um, you know, really person or persons that are uh, reviewing SB, overseeing SB 1383, leave, retire, whatever that is, that other people know how to maintain these programs and they just don't sort of fall apart, that there's a system to review what we do and how we do it. So. Thank you, Judy. And I'm going to deviate slightly from the how to just a little bit. If anybody would like to add a peer share on what they are doing for this, please go ahead and, and raise your hand. 
I am actually watching the raise your hand function for the next approximately 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. It sounds like no one has anything to add, but you can always um, use the chat function to talk to each other directly. There should be a drop down that enables you to choose another participant to talk to. Um, our next question is from an anonymous participant who is asking about the different software available for record keeping and solid waste management. Now, uh, we can't necessarily endorse any, but we are aware of at least three that are available. There's one that used to be called the Recyclist that has now changed its name to, I think, Routeware. It's a recent change. Um, there is Go to Zero, who were kind enough to come and participate in our webinar today. In our webinar today, their database is called Smart 1383. Um, and there is also one called Minerva. CalRecycle also puts out um, some helpful record keeping tools. We have a um, spreadsheet that many jurisdictions use to um, just organize all of their information and provide a roadmap to where all of their documents for their record keeping are located. Um, Oh, and Nikhil Balachandran just added in the comments that Zabble is another tool that can be used for route review and contamination monitoring. I believe that's Nikhil's um, tool, actually. So um, anybody, if anybody else has another one to add, please go ahead and drop that in the chat. And I believe those are the ones that I am aware of off of the top of my head, um, and I hope that is helpful. Please go ahead and send an email to slcp.organics at calrecycle.ca.gov if you would like for us to send you links to any of those um, to any of those tools that I just mentioned. All right, next up, we have another question from an anonymous participant uh, who says, we have multiple departments managing their own implementation records for separate sections of the regulations. Each is on their own network files. We have a common implementation record spreadsheet with links to each network file location. Will CalRecycle allow for multiple staff to show records from their department's network folder system, or must they be accessible by a single staff person? Another great question. And the regulations say that jurisdictions will provide access to the records to CalRecycle. So what you've described would be providing um, access in, in one location. I'm hearing like a building. <laughs> and um, so the fact that it's managed by multiple people is not a problem. Um, it just, we would need to be able to gain access to that within 10 days. Unmuting myself helps. All right, thank you, Marshall. And our next question is also from an anonymous participant. So I'll go ahead and read it. Um, the anonymous participant is wondering, do commercial edible food generators need to keep separate records for each food recovery organization they donate to? And the second part is, do their pounds need to be recorded separately? Um, so that is a great question. Um, I am currently looking for the edible food recovery subject matter expert to see if either of them know 
the answer to that off of the top of their heads because I do Why not. Why don't we come back to it and if yeah. we can um, respond to it um, before the webinar concludes, then that will be great. And if not, we'll add it to our list that we include for follow-up. Okay. So I made the subject matter experts that they're also co-hosts so they can unmute once we're ready to circle back around to this one. All right, next question is, if a jurisdiction cannot provide CalRecycle access to their records within 10 business days or even within a reasonable time frame, what would happen from there? Um, so? Well, that would be something that you would definitely need to communicate to Chase upon the compliance evaluation. Um, there could be a possibility of extending the timeline, um, but that's something that would have to be discussed with Chase at the time of the compliance evaluation. And I honestly haven't looked at the penalties, but not having an implementation record is... I'll look and put it in the chat. It it might, it's likely a um, severe, how we, we have them tiered um, types of penalties. So I'll look in the regulations and see, but that would be, um, you would be out of compliance for all the record keeping, which would be significant. So um, if that's the case, anonymous participant and to the rest of you, that's what we're here for in local assistance. If you don't have an implementation record um, developed and you're not, or you're not maintaining one, let's get in touch with our um, your LAMD representative and schedule time so that we can address that gap. Thanks, Marshall. And if you're not sure who your LAMD local assistance liaison is, you can just go ahead and send an email to slcp.organics at calrecycle.ca.gov and we will put you in touch with them. All right, we have another anonymous question who is asking, while it is understood, the CalRecycle can request to review a jurisdiction's implementation record at any time, and jurisdictions have 10 days to provide. Is there a sense of timing when CalRecycle may proactively start contacting jurisdictions to request this information, or will there be random spot checks of whether jurisdictions are complying with the implementation record requirements? Uh, Marshall, maybe you can talk some more about the compliance evaluation process. You're muted, by the way. I got lost in my screens, I apologize. So let me start, let's see. So um, we are gonna, uh, CalRecycle is starting the next group of compliance evaluations for this year. We have 25 that are in process. And so the process has been so far that you'll be notified formally with a letter coming from Cal Recycle, specifically from Jace, uh, noticing that you are on you are on a compliance evaluation. And that one doesn't have any specific action. It just talks about the process. And per the regulations, we're required to provide that notification. And then similarly, we ask for the implementation record. And we have decoupled those notifications um, so that when we notice a jurisdiction, that doesn't set the 10 days right then. So the first batch, we were able to send out a not notification saying, hi, you've been selected for a compliance evaluation, which everybody gets once every four years. And then a week later, sent the request for the implementation record so that there was additional time for um, to provide access, excuse me. 
Um, I don't, I have not heard anything about spot checks. I mean, the regulations are pretty clear that, that a compliance evaluation will be done and the process for that. But going back to what I had mentioned earlier is that not a spot check, but your local assistance and market development uh, liaison here at Cal Recycle is interested in reviewing your implementation record with you, identifying if there's anything that's missing um, to help peer match, like some of the follow-up that's gonna happen from today's meeting. So um, again, it's not a spot check and it's not a part of the formal and compliance evaluation, but since the implementation record is so critical to your compliance evaluation, we want to make sure we set you up for success. And so that's what we're able to offer um, at this point. And I did look, oh, and I'll come back to the other question later. All right, thanks, Marshall. I hope I um, addressed the question. I, I think so. Um, I just wanted to add, because I just talked to the jurisdiction and agency compliance and enforcement branch about this the other day, I just wanted to add that the current plan is to send out those compliance evaluation notifications via email to the SLCP designated contact as listed in your local government information center database page for your jurisdiction. So please make sure that that stays up to date. And if you need to update it, please let your land local assistance liaison know. We have a form for that and they can help you fill it out. Oh, and Kristen Sale just said, LAMD is helping Sonoma County by reviewing our implementation record prior to Jace sending out the compliance reviews to us. Yep, we are currently working hard on that. And um, it's one of the situations where your LAMD representative will be happy to help. And we're learning together. I think that's really important. Um, I did wanna give you my response to the other question about um, what if we don't have an implementation record? And I, I, the most important thing is that we're here to provide assistance and um, help mitigate that. But I was uh, correct in that uh, the lack of having um, an, an implementation record or the failure to have an implementation record is considered a, um, a major violation. So that is something we definitely want to avoid and have the means to do so together. Yes, your land local assistance liaison would love to help you with this. Um... If if you are looking at your implementation record and going, oh, I think it's it's lacking, then please reach out and we would love to help you. Um, our next question is another uh, anonymous question. Uh, they are asking, how far back might CalRecycle impose fines for non-compliance? Is it consistent with the record keeping timeline as far back as five years? I do not know the answer to that, honestly. <laughs> um, should we circle back around to this one, Marshall? Yeah, I'll look in, in the regulations. I, I honestly, I'm sorry, I should know things like that, but I honestly have not, have not walked down that line. Like, what will happen if, what would the fine be? What is, I think I'm still stuck on the uh, assistance. So let me dive in and see what I can find. Yeah. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but at, at this point, it would go back to January 1st, 2022, right? Because that is when SB 1383 took effect. But What I wanted to check is, <clears throat> I just learned this the other day from a frequently asked question that in, in the regulations, there are specific formulas for how penalties are done. And again, I'm, I'm not familiar with them, so I'm going to look. Look back at the rest. 
Yeah. I, I understand. In all honesty, uh, as a land local assistance liaison, I'm like, that is the compliance and enforcement people's problem. So I don't know the answer to that either, but we will find one for you, anonymous participants. Um, our next question is also anonymous, um, which makes it a little tricky to follow up on, uh, who is wondering, does anyone have an RFP they can share for SB 1383 software? Um, so any of the participants on this call, if you are, if you have an RFP you are willing to share with another jurisdiction who is looking for SB 1383 software, please uh, drop it in the chat um, and hopefully this anonymous participant will be able to find it using the chat function. All right, and the next one is, can you clarify that the implementation record, which should be available within 10 days, refers only to the overview spreadsheet? We can link all documents to this spreadsheet, but we allow a 60-day leeway to get the documents into the folder. Does that fall within compliance? That is really getting into the weeds. I know I'm, I need to see it. Sorry. All it? right. Okay. okay this so is another one we're going to circle back around to. Thank you for submitting your question. Um, and to provide you with an accurate answer, we're going to look into this question. Um, unfortunately, because this is an anonymous submission, um, we're going to have difficulty circling back around to you via email, but if you send it via email to slcp.organics at calrecycle.ca.gov, we'll follow up with you after the meeting. All right, our next question is from Harmeen Carr. Harmeen? You should be able to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and unmute and tell us your affiliation and ask your question if you are able to. Let's see. I think they may not be able to unmute, so I am just going to go ahead and read the question. Uh, they're wondering, under the recycled content requirements, is a jurisdiction required to purchase the recycled printing paper, even if it is expensive than the regular non, I, I assume they meant more expensive than the regular non-recycled paper. Um, so the we, answer to this, oh, mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead. sorry. Um, so the minimum post-consumer recycled content fiber requirements are required when they're available at no greater cost than the non-recycled product, and the fitness and quality are equal to non-recycled products. However, jurisdictions are not restricted from purchasing recycled content paper products that cost more than non-recycled products, which may support their sustainability goals or more environmentally preferable purchasing choices. And that's from the CalRecycle website. I'm going to go ahead and drop the link into the chat. Marshall, did you have something to add? Oh, no, you, you addressed oh, okay. it. And one of the oh. things that you do want to include in the implementation record, and it's not limited to paper procurement, <clears throat> is if you haven't implemented the program or it's not fully implemented, you want to include those details. Right. If you are running into a barrier, you want to ensure that your implementation record has that information. Because again, this is the basis, the fundamental basis for the initial work on your compliance evaluation. So that's where you know, Jace is going to be looking for those answers. And then if they're not there and they're required, we have a, you know, an a compliance issue. But also they're going to have to ask you for that information and get it anyway. Hey, Marshall, I'll just add to that. We have information um, on the website about this. So it's really important if you were not able to purchase recycled content paper because of cost, 
could be availability, et cetera, you do have to include an explanation in your implementation record. So it's um, really important, as Marcel said, to make sure that you document and explain and provide that, um, that information and make sure it's associated with that purchase. I think some folks have been, oh, well, I bought paper and it didn't have recycled content, so I don't need to have that record. And that's not um, correct. You need to record that you bought a paper product and then you know it was X amount uh, it was more than um, the cost of, of, of uh, the recycle content paper product, something along those lines. Thanks, Marcel. All right. And I think that's a good rule of thumb generally for your implementation record is to document your efforts and take notes and include those with your implementation record. Um, our next question is also from an anonymous participant, so I'll go ahead and read it. If we don't have an implementation record for 2023, but by the time we get reviewed in 2025 or beyond, we have a full implementation record for that year and going forward, should we make up an implementation record for 2023 or other missing years or just go forward with true documentations. We previously thought the implementation record was a living document, but listening to this, it makes it sound like you'll ask for five years of implementation records, meaning we'll have to have it archived as a moment in time at the end of each year. Am I understanding that correctly? A lot of pieces in there, I love it. All right. so. You do want to go back to 2022 and 2023 and provide what you have. So, it, and provide maybe those explanations if you don't have something, because we do go all the way back to 2022 at this point. So right now they're looking at 2024, 2023, and then 2022. So you would want to populate it so that it includes the information or an explanation why it's not there. Um, and we we spoke to the different kinds of data a little bit in the presentations. And some of that data is dynamic and some of it's static, right? So some of the information um, is changing throughout the year that you're in, but once it's passed, I do believe um, as you said, it would be archived. I mean, not technically archived, but yes, it would be at that point, it would be static. It wouldn't be in flux or changing as it would be in the current year that you're in. Yeah, Marcel, I'll add to uh, what to amplify what you just said. Um, you know, whether you call it archiving or saving it at that point in time, as Marcel said. The enforcement team will go back to previous years. So you want to make sure that, you know, for example, if it's related to contamination monitoring and the number of notices that were issued, uh, say, to residents for contamination, you want to make sure that you're not overriding the previous year's data in your system. So make sure that your system is set up so that there is that um, complete year of information when that year ends. And then in the next year, right, you're starting to add to those records. Um, I do think that if you are in a situation where you have not kept any or all records uh, for the first two years, we absolutely would say prioritize first getting um, current records in and then going back and filling in those records um, that you should have been keeping. And then to Marshall's point, amplify that, that if for some reason you don't have a record, say from 2022, at least in your implementation record, note that, uh, provide an explanation, and make sure going forward that you've got those records. And those are situations that we will be uh, looking at and taking into consideration when we conduct an evaluation. Thanks, Marshall. All right, thanks, Kara. Our next question is another anonymous question. 
Uh, this anonymous participant says, I heard from an attendee of a recent conference that CalRecycle identified the next 100 jurisdictions to receive a compliance evaluation. If we haven't been notified yet, does that mean we are not on the list? Or do you have the list and are still sending notifications? Yeah, I'll take that one. So, so we have we have actually identified the next 150 or so jurisdictions that will be receiving evaluations. That list um, is not available yet. We're still uh, going through the internal approval processes. Uh, the the processes those jurisdictions will be notified um, prior to their evaluation commencing. So, for example, the local assistant staff have been working with about the 50. 50 some, I was, Marshall, I always forget the exact number, 50 some, um, under 60, more than 50, somewhere in there. Um, we have already uh, contacted those jurisdictions. As Marshall said, we're working very closely with each of those jurisdictions to go over in a very detailed manner their implementation records, uh, making sure that they have everything or if they don't have something that there's an explanation there making sure that we go over uh, that it's in a, a format that can be provided to CalRecycle and spending time with a jurisdiction for, you know, kind of over a few week period of time to just go over each and every record, you know, is that description there? Um, is it a description that meets the regulatory um, requirement, for example? So uh, as those jurisdictions are being receiving compliance assistance, they will then receive a formal notification from the enforcement branch when that evaluation um, is going to commence and the timeline in which they will need to submit the implementation record. And then that will happen going um, forward with the next batch of jurisdictions. And we do not have specific timelines on kind of when that is all happening. After jurisdictions have been uh, formally noticed, as we did with the first 25 uh, jurisdiction uh, compliance evaluations, we did list those jurisdictions up on our website. So that will happen also um, kind of in, uh, uh, in sync uh, after they've been notified, then we'll be getting that up on the, the website. I hope that answers the, the question. Marshall, was there anything I missed that you want to add? Nope, that was perfect. All right. Um, I think we are approaching three o'clock. So I don't know that we have time for any more questions. We will do our best to follow up with people uh, who had questions in the queue that we did not get to. However, if you asked a question anonymously, we don't have a way to follow up with you. So please use the email on the screen, slcp.organics at calrecycle.ca.gov send your question in that way, and we will address it via email. Hey, Katie, I, there's three in there, and I think I can knock them out really quickly. Oh, okay. Hey, if you, if you can get them before three, go so for it. Please. You don't have to have a, a title for the implementation record by year. Um, it doesn't have constraints on it like that. So <clears throat> we saw one example with that where jurisdiction is saving their files um, by year but that's, that's not required. They just have to be, you need to be able to provide us access to the information for a five-year period if, if and when it's available. Um, regarding how long a compliance evaluation takes, that depends. And um, we're, still, we're still concluding the first 25 and learning a lot from that process. And then as Kara said, rolling out into the, um, this year, and I think as we go forward, it'll take less time because we'll you know, streamline the process. But right now there's not a, a good lasso I can put around that time frame. And then the last was about the optional items in the model tool. And they are exactly that. They're optional. They're intended to provide an, a, an example of how you might organize the information. So Katie, I think that covers the, the last ones. Yep, I, you got through those very quickly. Yeah. 
Um, thanks. But again, if you have any follow-up questions, if you're one of the participants who had one of those questions, please send it to the SLCP Organics inbox. All right, and I can wrap it up. Can you, oh, all right. So just to wrap things up, I'm so thrilled with the information that we've shared, the questions that were asked, the scenarios that were posed. Um, and I want to keep the conversation going. And just in follow-up today, I anticipate that there will be three actions at a minimum. One will be that our team is going to be uh, doing an update to the implementation record checklist as well as to the model implementation record to ensure that they're consistent and provide as much clarification as possible and um, to incorporate any examples or a greater level of detail and clarity. Um, I also anticipate, as, as I mentioned earlier, that we would get a number of questions that we'll be vetting and posting as Q&A. And I hope to continue that so that we can um, share tips, tricks, you know, and iron out details that may not be clear in the regulations. And then again, if you're not already working with your local assistants and market uh, development uh, liaison regarding an initial review and getting feedback on your implementation record, please take a, mom a moment to reach out and get something on the calendar. In terms of what's coming up, we are going to take a small break for July as it relates to these chats with Cal Recycle, but we'll be resuming um, in August with top, uh, August and September. Um, we'll be resuming with topics including what's happening around the um, edible food, excuse me, the tier two commercial edible food generators and also taking a deeper dive into compliance pathways to meet the requirements for recovered organic waste product procurement. And then, and for now, that concludes this month's webinar. Again, I wanna say a huge thanks to all of our presenters and all of the attendees that participated today. These chats could not be possible without you. And we truly appreciate and value the level of engagement from each of you. Again, as Katie said, if you have any questions, recommendations, or suggestions um, for these chats in the future, um, you can send them to the SLCP inbox. Thanks again, and I hope you all have a wonderful remainder of the day.